Municipal governments are comprised of local elected officials and encompass a range of administrative bodies, including cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. Join us in the political trenches, local government at work, as we examine the most pressing issues confronting municipal governments throughout Canada. I, along with my co-host, Ian McCormack, president of Strategic Steps Incorporated, will provide insights and perspectives on the challenges and opportunities that confront local governments as they strive to serve their communities. Today, we bring you the letter K, which stands for Keeping Municipalities Safe. Later in the episode, we'll be speaking with an Ontario MPP who has introduced a piece of legislation to hold local elected leaders accountable for their actions. We will also talk about Council's Code of Conduct, a petition in a small town BC municipality that was sparked due to council members approving a 30% pay increase for themselves, and Ontario's largest municipality without any legal cannabis retail stores is reconsidering its prohibition on them. But first, Ian, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm uh, actually out of town at the moment. I'm uh, hanging out in Jasper for a few days, so I'm really quite enjoying this. The vast majority of municipalities in Newfoundland and Labrador now have a code of conduct established. In total, 97% of municipalities, or 262, have implemented a code of conduct. These codes are meant to strengthen municipal governance and contribute to the successful day-to-day -day operations of a community. The Municipal Code of Conduct, which was passed by the Newfoundland and Labrador Legislative Assembly, came into effect in September of last year. It requires councils to establish their own code of conducts to address issues such as conflict of interest, bullying, and harassment in the workplace. Ian, why is it important for municipalities to have code of conducts? So this is becoming more and more common across the country. It wasn't that long ago that few, if any, provinces and territories had codes of conduct or codes of ethics for local elected officials. And what it's doing is it's moving the, it's, it's codifying what is acceptable behavior or what is unacceptable behavior before transgressions actually occur. So it's not me saying to some, just to one of my council colleagues, hey, I think you're doing something wrong. It is, we have a piece of paper here that we are all agreed to that this is acceptable behavior and you are not abiding by it. So in that way, I think the code of conduct codifies things that an ethical person, um, somebody who's truly community spirited would be doing anyway. So I think that's why they're becoming popular. We're also seeing more transgressions happening, whether they're real or perceived transgressions of ethical behavior, uh, codes uh, like uh, conflicts of interest, pecuniary interest, all those sorts of things which can be covered. So they're becoming important. However, what we are seeing is that the the best of these have the best of these codes really outline what is acceptable behavior, what's unacceptable behavior, how there can be some complaint made formally or informally, and then what kind of sanctions can be provided. And the sanctions of course are quite limited because of the order of government and that one order of government can't, a council member can't remove their own members, for example. But what we've seen some other places, Ontario, for example, has instituted their, their integrity commissioners. We're going to talk about that in a little while, which has tried to take it one step removed from council. But in most places, the well, in all places, the final decision either rests with council or if the transgression is significant enough, it moves to the provincial or territorial government. And then eventually, of course, the courts can be recourse as well. So this is something we're seeing more and more, and I think it's a, I think it's wise. Uh, it's it it helps to try and keep those proverbial barn doors closed before the horses even think about getting out to bolt. It also gives a bit of a baseline of expectation: what citizens can expect, what council colleagues can expect, what administrators can expect as well. So in that way, I. We're seeing more of these. I would not be surprised to see every province and territory have these in the not too distant future. Harrison Hot Springs, located in British Columbia, councillors have been formally asked to resign. A resident of the community appeared as a delegate before Harrison Council earlier this month, where she presented two petitions to council. One calling for the resignation of four members of council and to call on council to rescind the 30% pay raise and allowances they recently approved. Ian, how did municipal leaders vote on issues related to themselves without it seeming like a conflict of interest? 
Well, I think that you you use the word seem like a conflict of interest, and I think that's that's quite quite true. And and because we're going alphabetical, I think we could do P is for pay raises and just have an entire session about that. So in this case, there is no further legislative body and local government than the local government council itself. So anything that happens within the authority of the local government has to be a decision of council. That is, and even in this case, say for um, for pay raises. I, I think there's nobody else who's going to vote for them or against them. The final authority is uh, for, is of councils, and they have to vote on it because they vote on the budget. It's not a conflict of interest for them because it affects everybody equally, not an individual member of council. It's the same as you could say councils in a conflict of interest because they set property tax rates. Everybody owes property taxes, so it's the same to me anyway. It's the same argument. Councils can go as far as asking external people for advice on council uh, remuneration. 30% does seem like a lot, but I don't know the circumstance. But ultimately, the vote is councils. The second question you asked about almost around self-interest. And uh, Harrison Hot Springs has been in the news recently and not for the best of reasons. So my suspicion is there is something uh, more going on there. And if you started to peel back the onion, you would get to trying to figure out what it, what it's really about. And it's probably not something quite so superficial as what we're seeing here, that there's probably something either historic or ethical or uh, maybe with some sort of uh, factions in town as well that's having an impact on this. But four members of council is a significant number. In fact, I suspect, given Harrison Hot Springs, that it's a majority of council who are being asked to resign. I suspect it's very unlikely that it's going to happen. And of course, this is a very relevant topic, given what we're talking about later on today as well. Ontario's largest municipality, the city of Mississauga, without any legal cannabis retail stores, is reconsidering its prohibition on them, with a city report highlighting that its residents are disproportionately served by the illegal market. Ian, is it rare for councils to revisit a decision made by a past council? No, it's not. It's not uh, at all. The environment keeps shifting. Uh, morals keep shifting. Of course, if you look at even the legalization of marijuana through the last electoral term was something that uh, that um, councils elected in the 1950, sorry, 19, 2015, 2017, never really anticipated having to deal with. So because of that, it's not unusual. It would be more unusual if it was a motion to reconsider, say, within the same council term. Uh, this sort of same group of people. This, because things have changed in the environment that they've mentioned the illegal market, which was, of course, the only market there was prior to the, the legalization. I'm not surprised to see this. And it's just a reflection of demand and changing uh, the changing changing of society, really. Is this council admitting that they got it wrong in some sense? I don't even think it's that. I think that uh, your, you want your council to reflect the depth and breadth of your community, the the morals of your community, the ethics of your community, the demands of your community. And this is just a case where those things have changed over time. Even if you go back to times like a prohibition, for example, using that argument, you could have said that the, the elimination of prohibition would be the admission that was wrong. And in that case, maybe maybe that's the case. But uh, this one being much more recent, of course, the time is a lot narrower between the legalization of marijuana, presumably then the decision of that Mississauga City Council not to provide licenses, permits, any of those sorts of things and now is much shorter than it would have been during prohibition. So no, I, I don't think it's an admission of wrong. I think it's just an admission of change, if anything else. So we'll be right back after a quick message with our interview with Ontario MPP Stephen Belay. Welcome to K is for keeping municipalities safe on the political trenches, local government at work. Today, we are honored to have Ontario MPP Stephen Blay. Stephen is currently serving as the member of provincial parliament for the riding of Orleans, a role he has been in since a by-election in 2020. Prior to being elected to provincial office, Stephen served as councillor for Cumberland Ward in the city of Ottawa. Today, we want to dive into Bill 5 or Stopping Harassment and abuse by local leaders act we will discuss how this bill will work his thoughts on how municipalities across ontario are passing motions to support the members bill Stephen, welcome to the show thank you and thank you uh for having me 
So I want to start with the, the, the million dollar question here. Where did Bill 5 come from? Because it, you must have seen a need that this was not being addressed. So you presented this bill. How did it come about? Yeah, so um, it really stemmed from my time uh, on Ottawa City Council. So in my last term on council, um, right around, I guess, over the winter of 18 into 19, uh, there were some uh, rumors floating around the city that um, one of our colleagues was under investigation. We didn't really know who or what. And it was just kind of gossip and rumors. And those uh, kind of persisted throughout much of uh, much of uh, 2019. And uh, eventually it was revealed that um, uh, some pretty significant allegations were made against uh, one of my colleagues at the time, Councillor Rick Shirelli, who had been elected to Ottawa City Council for, you know, 30 years, I think, uh, at that point, uh, going back to the pre-amalgamation days. And um, uh, slowly over the course of um, 2019, uh, the media got a hold of uh, of stories, um, and as it turns out, and has been demonstrated through a series of integrity commissioner investigations, and in fact, uh, a court ruling basically upholding the the facts of the matter. Uh, Mr. Shirelli had been uh, psychologically, emotionally um, harassing and and tormenting his staff, uh, many staff members, female staff members. Over, over the course of um, years and years. And um, uh, as that was kind of developing, as the first stories were appearing in the newspaper, and as we had uh, requested or been informed that the integrity commissioner um, was uh, was looking into these matters, this is when the by-election in Orleans happened and, and I got elected to, to provincial parliament in, uh, in February of, of 2020. So skip ahead to the fall of that year, uh, the Integrity Commissioner had done some investigations and the City of Ottawa had, uh, Council had uh, received the report and um, accepted the conclusions of the report and uh, begun the uh, the consequence part of, uh, of the process. And in Ontario, under the Municipal Act, um, consequences for this kind of behavior for, for councillors and for mayors um, are quite limited. Uh, you know, they can be barred from access, accessing city facilities and buildings, um, and they can be docked pay. Uh, I believe it's uh, 90 days uh, is the maximum that they can be docked pay. And so because there had been a, a number of violations, or the Integrity Commissioner had ruled that there had been a number of violations, the city uh, took a pretty liberal, I think, interpretation of the law and, and docked the 90 days pay for each of the individual uh, um, situations. And so resulted in, in, in Rick losing pay for about a year, something like that, just under a year. Um, and uh, they had all expressed a point of view, the council and, and the mayor, um, Jim Watson at the time, that they didn't feel that the docking of pay was really um, a satisfactory consequence given the nature of uh, of what he had done. And they began to engage uh, the province, uh, Minister Clark, uh, to have the uh, the integrity rules for, for municipal uh, politicians changed so that one of the consequences could be, uh, you know, losing your seat, vacating, vacating office. And this was, as I said, towards the back end of, of 2020. Uh, as it happens, I believe November is... Um, uh, um, there's a month in November, I believe it's relating to stopping the abuse of women. I don't remember the formal name of it now, but I gave uh, I gave him a, a statement in the house at that time, basically calling on the government to to take up this uh, take up this uh, this concern this challenge uh, because in the interim, I had learned that in addition to the the situation in Ottawa, which was uh, pretty severe, and if you hear the specifics of the allegations, pretty um, pretty atrocious. That there was, uh, you know, I would argue an equally uh, serious and atrocious situation in Brampton that had been ongoing for a long time. There was one that we were just starting to, to hear about uh, developing in Barrie. And then as it turns out, over the course of the next number of months, 
um, uh, lots of other stories came forward, including uh, one in, in Mississauga where a counselor was actually harassing another counselor and ultimately to the point where uh, she chose to resign her office because she just uh, it wasn't worth dealing with, right, the, the trauma of it all. And so when the government responded to the city uh, and, to, to, and to me, because I had written to the minister asking for the same thing, they basically said, no, thanks, we're not going to get into it, um, you know, thanks very much. Um, I started working on uh, the first version of the bill and and ultimately introduced it in um, the, for the first time, I guess, in the spring of uh, I, I guess the spring of 21. And it's and it's kind of been on a path uh, ever since. I think this is now the third iteration of the bill because it's it's died once because of prorogation. And then uh, we got it uh, past second reading, uh, and then it died with the election last spring, and the, and now we're on to the try number three. I'll jump in if I can. And presumably, when you were uh, working on this, and other people perhaps doing some research for you, you might have seen uh, bills or law in uh, acts in other provinces or other codes of conduct, codes of ethics that local governments are looking at uh, or have in place there too. How did you end up uh, where you did with regards to Bill 5? And did you see anything else you saw as particularly innovative in other provinces or things that were pretty consistent with other provinces or territories as well? Yeah, I think the challenge when you're talking about um, consequences for elected officials is that, you know, uh, we live in a democratic society, obviously, and the will of voters is ultimately the, uh, you know, the, kind of the ultimate deciding force and factor. And so I think broadly speaking, there's, um, hesitation to kind of go down the route of this kind of consequence for elected officials for most for most things. Mm -hmm. I think there's obviously an evolution in society as well, where you know this kind of behavior, while never appropriate, was tolerated or not talked about for you know decades and decades and decades, and as a result became kind of almost habitual, just kind of part of the game type of practice, unfortunately, for women who, who work in politics and in, and in government and probably many other professions. And so um, there wasn't a lot that we could see that pre-existed other than uh, uh, laws around election finance violations and a conflict, of a conflict of interest violations. So at least in Ontario, if you're in a conflict of interest and you're found to have acted in the conflict and it's um you know serious enough you can you can be forced to vacate your office for that right. uh, if there's an election spending violation you're you're forced to uh, to vacate office for that and in ontario you go one step further we have two we have two election finance rules in ontario for for municipal candidates there's the spending limit during the what you would call the the writ period i guess for lack of a better term that the money you spend to actually help you get elected and then there's a second spending limit that only applies to your victory party or your post election day celebrations and if you go over that second spending limit which is basically for beer and food for your volunteers on election night if you go over that limit by by one cent there is no process. The automatic consequence is vacating of office. Like there's no wiggle room at all there. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about that, buying a beer for a volunteer who knocked on doors for four months after the election is over can get you kicked out of office. But asking your uh, assistant go to, to go to a strip club to spy on your political enemies uh, will get you, you know, the equivalent of a slap on the wrist. It, it didn't really make a lot of sense. And so we we formulated Bill 5 really around the both the process and then the ultimate consequence around conflict of interest uh, provisions, really. This, this bill seems like a slam dunk. It seems like something that needs to happen. But you were on your third iteration of this. You talked about how it was presented in 2021. You prorogued, presented in 2022, election happened. You're presenting it for a third time. What's stalling this process? Because it seems like this would be a no-brainer for any government to say, okay, we need better rules and regulations when it comes to our local elected officials. And I know I'm asking the political question here, Stephen. I do apologize, but I feel like as an elected official, you're ready for the political question. So what's holding this bill up? Yeah, well, politics. Um, <laughs> so... Um, as I was preparing to introduce the bill for the first time, I uh, uh, 
shortly before I had intended to introduce it, uh, I started to begin to speak to some stakeholders to try to establish some, you know, third party validation and 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 things like that. And basically, a couple of days after that process begun, the government held a shotgun uh, late afternoon on a Friday news conference to announce that they were going to conduct um, consultations about this very issue uh, across the province. And so then I introduced my my bill basically the next business day after that. Um, and so the government has done consultations across this with municipalities in Ontario. Uh, they they did that over the course of I don't know six six to nine months, something like that. Both the the Minister of Municipal Affairs and at the time the uh, the Minister responsible for women's issues. And um, it's important to note that the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, which is uh, you know, all 400 and, and some odd municipalities in Ontario getting together uh, to, to help advocate for municipal issues to the, to the government. They have broadly endorsed um, the ideas that are encapsulated in my bill. They, they haven't come out and said, you know, Blaze bill is what you should do, but basically that there needs to be a review of the process. There needs to be a consequence for this kind of thing. And the consequence needs to include, you know, the, the ability to be removed from office, basically. And so... They kind of um, dragged their feet on it the first time because they were doing a they were doing a, their own process and they were going to have their own bill. And in fairness, for me, I thought that was perfectly fine. If the government wants to bring a bill tomorrow, uh, we've told them we'll support it. Uh, that's no problem, and we'll do whatever we can to to have that done quickly. And in fact, in the um, sort of time is blended together. So let me just get my dates right. But in the in the in the fall before the the election last year, so I guess this would have been the fall of twenty one, uh, Minister Clark's office briefed me and briefed the NDP critic on their version of the bill, and they were getting ready to introduce their own version of the bill, and uh, both uh, our caucus and the NDP caucus committed in writing to do everything that we could to pass the bill quickly, uh, both through the, the the ledge and through committee so that it could be uh, receive royal assent and give the ministry and the minister enough time to implement uh, changes and, and you know pass whatever regulations might need to follow before the municipal election cycle uh, started in 2022. And that, that starts in May in, in Ontario. And so we had committed to that. As it turns out, they never introduced their own bill. Um, and so we voted on it. We debated mine and, and voted on mine in, in March. Uh, which still gave the government, you know, six or seven weeks to send it to committee and, and bring it back. In Ontario, they have passed major pieces of legislation in about 14 days when they really want to, even shorter than that. And so there was lots of time to do that. They chose not to send it to committee. Uh, when they were asked in question period why they weren't sending it to committee, they said I was grandstanding for the election, even though this process had been underway for, you know, the better part of a year and a half at that point. And then, you know, the election happens and it uh, everything comes off the table. And so I reintroduced it as uh, basically the first sitting day uh, back uh, uh, after the after the spring election. And um, in Ontario, the way that private members business works is everyone's name goes in a hat. Your name gets pulled out of a hat and that's the order you get to debate your your private members bills in. And so. Mine happens to be a, bit, a little bit later on the list, so we're going to we're going to get an opportunity to to debate it um, at the end of May. And um, I've been consistent the entire time. If if the government has their bill, and I know they have a version of the bill because I've seen it, if they want to introduce it, the offer is still on the table that we will, uh, you know, if it's clean and not you know attached to all sorts of other you know things that they might want to try to accomplish that we would disagree with that uh, we will we'll pass it up and down as, as fast as we can and they can they can be begin implementing it but to date they haven't uh, taken us up on that offer can I jump in and I, you, you you commented on the democrat the sacrosanct nature of democracy the will of the people being expressed that sort of thing yeah. and I'm sure it's a move not taken lightly and I noticed that to remove an elected official the language that you use in your bill is permissive rather than prescriptive. So it's you suggested that there can be other consequences too. Yeah. The nuclear option, if you like, of removing an elected official is one thing, but then the, 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 the ability of that elected official to uh, run again in the next election is something that has been removed as well. You've suggested, I think, that it ought to be two more elections, uh, that the, the person needs to sit on the sidelines and think a little bit about what they have done. 
yeah. which of course prevents the will of the, the people potentially from being expressed. Now, in some places, Alberta, for example, uh, the person who is disqualified from office can run in the next election. In Saskatchewan, they can't run for 12 years or essentially three elections. You've, you've landed on eight years, two plus election cycles, I guess, depending on when the person would be removed from office. How did you end up uh, with the concept of disallowing a person from standing for office in in the next election or two more for that matter too? Uh, because that is the same consequence that exists for election finance uh, violations. So at the end, at the end of the uh, municipal election, when you submit your um, you know financial disclosures and your audited statements, if you don't submit those, um, you're disqualified for 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 the two preceding the two preceding elections. And so I basically just duplicated that uh, that uh, that process. I knew that the hardest part of doing this would be the, you know, the sacrosanct nature of democracy, right? And so I was really intent on trying to find um, and duplicate the processes and consequences that already exists within our democratic environment for other uh, violations. Uh, I think election finance violations are obviously... Uh, very important. I don't think how much money you spend on beer at your victory party should really uh, force you to out of office, but you know that's another story altogether. But we have already agreed in Ontario that there should be certain processes for certain kinds of uh, offenses, most of them around money. Yeah, uh, that would lead you to 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 losing your office. I'm not sure, you know, and that's the whole point of the bill. Why that same process shouldn't exist if you're, you know. Uh, abusing, harassing, uh, you know, coercing your staff or your colleagues and, and others, uh, you know, emotionally, sexually, physically, uh, et cetera. Let's unmute myself here for a second. Stephen, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor to sit down with you and talk about Bill 5 and how it will impact and change the landscape of municipal local elected leaders when it comes to harassment. So thank you so much for A, advocating for this uh, need, but B, for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this with us. So greatly appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your interest and uh, congratulations on the show. Uh, look forward to, uh, well, maybe not listening to myself on your show, but <laughs> listening to the episodes that come after. Thank awesome. You, Appreciate it. So with that, we want to remind everyone our interview, our full interview with Stephen will be airing next Wednesday, but we will be right back after a quick message for a wrap up till then. So Ian, another great episode, uh, another great interview, uh, great stories, uh, very topical stories on today's episode. How'd you feel today's uh, show went? I thought the thread was really quite interesting. And the interview with the MPP, of course, uh, echoed a lot of things that we have been talking about. The other thing to that is it's a little distressing that there's a need for things like uh, what he was talking about, but certainly it is something that is prevalent in our society today. And it's it's unfortunate. Um, my hope is that, it, that it, we manage to deal with it in a very constructive way over the long term. And that the, we can bring some of that honor, if you like, back into local government and places where it just has disappeared at the moment. Which is kind of a good stepping stone for next week. So by the time this airs, we will be less than seven days away from the Bucking the Trend Symposium in Edmonton. You looking forward to it, Ian? Yeah, with nervous anticipation. I think I may have said that before. It's the first time that Strategic Steps has hosted a symposium of any sort, uh, particularly on a topic as important of the, as this. But uh, as we've just seen, it's hap the issues that we are looking at addressing are something that's happened from coast to coast. We talked about Newfoundland, we talked about BC, we interviewed in Ontario. So it's uh, it's certainly something that, that we really are, I think, a little bit privileged to, to have a look at. And hopefully we do it some justice. And I'm really looking forward to bringing all those people together in, in, uh, at the end of, the, end of April. 
I, I'm looking forward to it as well. But I want to take a moment and say we will be back in about a month's time. We've we uh, Ian and I have a symposium that we're going to be doing, so we won't be able to record. But we will be back in the middle of May with L. We're going to be deciding on what that's going to be later on. But stay tuned. Pa- watch past episodes. If you have any comments, if you have story ideas, which what is what came out of today's episode. Bill five yeah. was when someone messaged us and say, Hey, can you talk about this? So we did it. So this is how the show continues on with viewers, listeners like you. So send us messages of what some of the stories you want us to cover. Ian, it's always a pleasure to sit down with you. Indeed. You too, Chris. We'll uh, see you at the symposium and talk to you in about a month.